Hello everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to look at our first example that deals with the concept of a network. So networks are essentially um, representations of a situation where you have what can be referred to as a set of locations. And I say locations in quotes because these could be literally places, but they don't have to be. But imagine there's a set of locations and a set of links or connections, right, that connect these locations and allow things. And again, I say things because this can be a little bit more generic, but these connections or links allow things to move from one location to another. Right? So the most basic example is literally a location of, you know, for example, warehouses that have goods and the links could be routes connecting them, and you want to move move these goods from one place to another. This could be a network of banks, and the things that are to be moved are amounts of money, and the connections are potential transactions from one bank to another. Um, these could be a network of people, right? And what moves from person to person could be information, it can be, you know, conc more concrete or more abstract according to what you need. But essentially, that's what a network is. And we represent the, again, in quotes, locations where things are in a picture as circles, which are referred to as nodes of the network. And we'll, we're going to have arrows linking one circle to another with a direction to indicate that whatever is sitting at a given node can be moved to the other node in that direction. And these arrows can go back and forth between two nodes to say that movement can go in either direction or sometimes it's just a single direction. Um, and besides that, you're going to have, as part of your network, the amounts available of whatever it is that you are moving. Where are they sitting now and where are they going to? So you're going to have uh, supply amounts and demand amounts. So networks can get very big and very complicated, right? Imagine, you know, the network of transportation uh, for a company like FedEx or Amazon um, or, you know, an airline. Uh, so let's begin with a, a very simple example in which we will only have two kinds of nodes. We only have nodes that either are suppliers, they have things in them that are going to move out, and those are consumers or demand nodes, where places where we want the things to go. Um, and a problem like this it has a special name. It's called a transportation problem. Right? So I want to move things from supply nodes to demand nodes, and that's pretty much it. Uh, there is a third kind of node in a bigger kind of network, which is a node that can be a pass-through point. It's going to have arrows entering it and leaving from it. Uh, this is known as a transshipment node, and the networks that have that kind of node are called you know, transshipment networks and transshipment problems. We're going to see an example of this in another video. If that's what you're looking for, I'm going to put a link up here that you can click and go directly there, but if you um, don't know about a transportation network yet, I would I think it's a good idea to get familiar with this simpler version of the problem and then you move on to the transshipment version. So as I said, we only have here supply nodes, which are the nodes that give, so they only have arrows going out of them. And we have demand nodes, which are the nodes that only receive, so they only have arrows or arcs, as they are also known, entering them. So let's see a particular story here for this problem. Um, and I already noticed there is a typo in this description here. It says, uh, you know, a transportation problem is a simplification of the transshipment problem that only has supply and demand. I didn't mean to say notes, but instead nodes with a D. I'll fix that later. So there's no transshipment node, right? So there's a company called the Movi Facio, and they are transporting lawnmowers for John Deere and company from two of its warehouses, so the nodes numbered one and two in the picture are the warehouses where the lawnmowers are. 
and they're going to go to three customers. They could be, for example, three Home Depot stores, and I'm going to call them ABC. The customers are called ABC. ABC, they receive. So you see the arrows enter them because they're receiving the goods, and the arrows depart from the warehouses because the warehouses are sending the goods. Great. To indicate that the warehouses have the things in them, they are suppliers, we're going to use negative numbers. So this minus 40 means there is a supply of 40 units of the product, in this case lawnmowers, sitting at node 1. And there's a supply of 50 units of the product sitting at node 2. And a positive number in a network picture is going to represent demand. So these numbers 30, 30, 30 simply say each of the three customers ABC want 30 lawnmowers. Great. The final missing piece here is, well, how much does it cost to ship a lawnmower from one node to another? That's what the table gives you per unit. So for every lawnmower that you ship from warehouse 1 to customer A, you're going to pay $15. So if you ship 10 of these 40 this way, 1 to A, you're going to pay 10 times 15, 150. The objective here is I would like to move all of these 90 lawnmowers from the two warehouses to the three customers while spending the least amount of money possible. That's the objective, all right? So uh, we could uh, write a mathematical model for this problem and then solve it in Excel. Uh, briefly, what's going to happen is whenever you have a network problem, your variables will be one for every arc or arrow because what you're trying to find out in the network is how much is moving from one place to another, and the arrows are exactly what tell you that. So I need an x1, comma a to say how many units of the product should be moved from node 1 to node A. Maybe the answer is nothing. Don't move anything there because it's too expensive. Uh, in that case, the, this particular x variable will turn out to be 0. Or otherwise, it will give you a number to say out of these 40, so many should go this way. And I make one of these for every one of these variables for every arc. And the other thing that needs to happen is for each of these nodes in the network picture, I need a constraint to say whatever happens to that node needs to make sense. What does make sense mean? Uh, let's take a look in this particular problem. Uh, what we're going to need is this. Well, Warehouse 1 only has 40 units to give. So the obvious thing to say is whatever Warehouse 1 gives has to be at the most 40, right? And whatever Warehouse 2 gives has to be at the most 50 because it has 50. So I can write this this way. All the x's that depart from node 1 and go to A, and then from 1 to B, and then from 1 to C, the amounts shipped along the three arrows that depart from node 1 have to amount to 40. And I can see exactly 40 because there is a total demand of 90 units and a total supply of 90 units. So I know that Warehouse 1 needs to ship all the 40 that it has because supply equals demand in total. So the second constraint says Warehouse 2 has to ship all of what it need, of what it has, right? And for the customers, it's the counterpart of this, right? Customer A needs 30 units, so I need to say, wait, whatever enters customer A from node 1 and from node 2 in total, that has to amount to the 30 that it wants. So here we go. Shipments from warehouse 1 to customer A plus shipment from warehouse 2 to customer A equals what customer A wants. And likewise, you do the same for B and C. Right? That's it. That's the math model. We finish it with the objective. We minimize, right? Amount shipped times the cost per unit shipped along that route. So every unit shipped from 1 to A will cost you 15. Every one unit shipped from 1 to B will cost you 35, etc. Add them all up. You have the total cost. Good. So let's put this into Excel. Here we go. 
So uh, like we did in the blending problem, we have variables with two indices. Right? In this case, the x says what goes from here to here. So I uh, organize them in this rectangle format here to make uh, a few things easier to do. So for example, this cell here, B5, represents what? Represents the amount shipped, also known as the flow on the arc that goes from the flow of goods that goes from node 1, the warehouse 1, to customer A. Right? So this is the x1a variable, x1b, x1c. And remember, we have to say, hey, for node 1, the flow out of it, aka the outflow of node 1, the amount of goods that depart from node 1, has to equal what node 1 has. Node 1 has 40. So if I sum these variables here, x1a plus x1b plus x1c, that gives me the total shipment out of node 1. Right? And that's the first constraint in that math model we just saw. The nice thing about the rectangle is that if I copy this down, I get the total shipment out of node 2, the sum of the x's with the depart at node 2. Great. Conversely, if you recall from the math, the last three constraints said whatever enters a client has to equal what the client wants. What enters client A is the sum of the shipments that depart from node 1 going to A plus the ones that depart from node 2 going to A. So if I sum the cells this way, I get the shipments entering customer A. Again, the rectangle is going to help us here because now I can copy this formula to the right and I will get for free the shipments into node B and into node C. Okay, let's show that formula here. Great, so the last formula we need now is the objective. But if you remember from the math, it is simply every x variable multiplied by its corresponding shipment cost and then you add them all up. Well, this is our friend sum product. It's a sum of products. The products are an x variable and its corresponding cost. So if I take the six x variables and I sum product them with their six costs, I get the expression that is here. Right? 15x1a, 35x1b, 25x1c, etc. Okay, so that's that formula there. So we're now ready for, I know, to fill out the solver window there. Let's go. So data solver. Here we go. The objective cell is the one that has the formula to be minimized or maximized, which is this guy here. Right, uh, B16. Because this is cost, we are minimizing, so change that there. And the changing or variable cells are the variables we want solver to find for us. It's the ones I highlighted in gray, B5 through D6. And the constraints will be, well, on the supply side, we have to say the flows of goods, the shipments out of the suppliers, these two amounts, have to equal what the suppliers have. Right? I notice that I did these two things in one shot because they, are, they have the same symbol and they're stacked on top of each other like this. Uh, if you wanted to do them one at a time, of course, it would also work. So you could do E5 equal G5 and then do E6 equal G6. I just did E56 equal G56, either way. And the other thing we can do here is uh, do the equivalent on the um, customer side, the consumer side, and say the amounts that enter each of the three customers should equal the amounts that they want. And we have that there. And we just have to make sure that make variables non negative is checked. And this is uh, the simplex LP, the linear programming version of it. And now we're ready to solve this. Let's see. 
Okay, so what is this saying? It's telling me that it will cost $2,000 to move those 90 lawn mowers. And how do you move them? Well, the 40 that were in warehouse one, 10 of them you should send to customer A and 30 to customer C. The 50 that were in warehouse two, you should send 20 of them to customer A and 30 to customer B. Notice that warehouse one is shipping out 50, warehouse sorry, house house two shipping out 50, warehouse one is shipping out 40, and each of the customers is indeed getting the 30 they want. All right, and this is pretty much it. If you had a bigger version of the problem with more customers and more suppliers, it's simply a matter of, you know, making this a gray rectangle bigger, right? You have more lines for the additional suppliers, more columns for the additional customers, but the essence of the spreadsheet would remain the same the types of formulas you type in and so forth. So it's just a matter of making it a little bigger. Uh, final observation here is we did this uh, assuming we had the same amount of supply and demand on, right, on both sides, but what if that wasn't the case? It's a small adjustment. If you go back here, right, let's say there was more supply than demand. Well, if there's more supply than demand, I can still say the customers will get what they want, so I can keep these symbols here as equal. I would just, you know, change the supply constraint symbols from equal to less than or equal because I know I will use up to what I have, right? Less than or equal to what I have because there's an excess of supply. If it was the opposite, if you had an excess of demand, then, well, I know that I'm going to have to use up all the supply that I have because I am already under, so I might as well just ship everything. So you would keep the equality on the supply side constraints, but on the customer side constraints, you would not be able to maintain that equal because there isn't enough, right? So you would have to say that these symbols have to be less than or equal to, right? Because you will up to that amount that the clients want. You can't guarantee you will match the number. Uh, little adjustments you could make even to that is, well, maybe there are some preferential customers. You could perhaps maintain the equal sign just for those. Or if you wanted to enforce that, okay, I know that the customers won't get all that they want, but I want them to get at least 80% of what they are asking for, for example. You could add to the other side of this expression, right? You can say at the most a th uh, 30 for each of them, but at least, right, 24 if you're looking at 80% of that. So you say at least 24, at the most 30. Uh, again, assuming that you have 24 times 3 to give. But in essence, you, you, know, you make the, the um, intuitive modifications to the symbol from equal to transform it to less than or equal to depending on whether or not you have more supply or more demand and uh, of course you would go back to the Excel and whatever symbol you changed on the math from equal to less than you change the same one here and adjust the constraint accordingly all right so that's it for our transportation problem it's not that complicated um, I'll see you in the next video where we're gonna treat a variation of this called the assignment problem uh, which can be used to create um, interesting uh, pairs of things. And then later on, one more video on the transshipment version of this, where we have nodes that have arcs going both in and out of them. I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.